This is Daphne Bridgerton. This is Simon Bassett. This is Penelope Featherington. And this is Queen Charlotte. You know them from Bridgerton. You may remember this look or this one, this dress, and who could forget this one? But are they accurate? We got this fashion historian. Hi, I'm Raisa Britannia, and I'm a fashion historian. To walk us through what Bridgerton got right and what they got wrong about these looks. Bridgerton is a historical drama that centers around fictional characters as they navigate high society in Regency London. The Regency period in England lasted from 1811 to 1820. Bridgerton opens at the beginning of the 1813 social season in London. The season typically began in January or February and ran until about July or August. Therefore, a lady's lineup of clothing for the season had to be appropriate for spring and summer wear. Bridgerton dramatizes the strategic, sometimes manipulative, tactics that were used to navigate the highly competitive marriage market. The show centers around the ton, which was a term used to describe the highest echelon of the British social hierarchy. During this period, clothes were made to order by a local modiste, though luxurious materials and accessories were sometimes imported. Costume designer Ellen Mirajnik put a unique twist on Regency-era dress in order to support the show's highly stylized aesthetic. The costumes retain the distinctive columnar silhouette that defines early 19th century fashion, but the exuberant use of textiles and trimmings add drama to an era that features relatively simplistic styles of dress. Let's get into the looks. First up, Daphne's promenade dress. This look appears in episode two and could be described as an afternoon promenading ensemble. Promenading was a 19th century pastime which consisted of a leisurely stroll in a public place with the express purpose of seeing and being seen. Throughout the series, Daphne wears a total of 104 costumes, an entirely impossible amount of clothing for a woman in the early 1800s. All of her looks reflect elements of her signature style and her family's colors. The Bridgertons are always outfitted in soft pastel hues, and their signature shade of powdery blue reflects the family's established reputation for refinement and gentility. Let's draw this look layer by layer. First up, the undergarments and stockings. Daphne would be wearing a chemise as her innermost undergarment. This provided a protective layer between the corset and the skip. The absence of chemises in Bridgerton is the most obvious historical inaccuracy when it comes to the costumes. It's a rather common error made in period dramas, which often omit this layer in order to make historical underwear seem sexier to contemporary audiences. Daphne wears drawers throughout the series, but there is ongoing debate as to whether women wore them during the Regency era. There are historical records that testify to their existence in the early 19th century. However, they were not widely accepted until the 1830s. Daphne definitely would be wearing stockings, likely made of knitted silk and secured below the knee with ribbon garters. And then the corset. The corsets, or stays, of this period were not particularly restrictive. They were typically made of two layers of cotton or linen and lightly boned or corded. The corsets of Bridgerton were made by the legendary Mr. Pearl, who aimed to accurately recreate those from the early 1800s. The manner in which they are worn, however, is not accurate. This was not an undergarment that was meant to dramatically reshape the body and therefore was not intended to be tightly laced. Daphne wears a version of the Regency corset known as short stay or half stays. This type ended just below the bust and coincided with the shortened bodices of the early 19th century silhouette. That brings us to the petticoat. For most of the 19th century, the petticoat typically resembled a skirt, which covered the lower half of the body. However, the Regency era petticoat had an attached bodice, making it look more like an underdress or a modern slip. This modesty layer was especially important during this period, when dress fabrics were very lightweight and could be quite sheer. Let's move on to the next layer. Throughout the 19th century, it was considered inappropriate for a lady's chest to be exposed during the day. A tucker or chemisette 
would be worn to fill in the neckline. For afternoon dress, a sheer tucker would be acceptable, but an opaque one would be needed in the morning. We do see Lady Bridgerton appropriately wearing a tucker in this scene, and Eloise often wears a chemisette with a ruffled collar. Next up, the dress. It was also considered inappropriate for a lady's arms to be exposed during the day. This is another common mistake made in Regency-era historical dramas. Daphne's dress would be long-sleeved with a square neckline filled in with a tucker. Daphne's sheer sleeves could be acceptable for afternoon attire. However, this trend didn't start until later in the 1810s. Sheer sleeves would become more prominent in women's afternoon styles in the 1820s and 30s. Dresses during the previous decade were famously made of lightweight muslin. And though these diaphanous white gowns remain commonly associated with a Regency era, Ellen Morajna consciously avoided them because she felt that they were too limp and colorless for the world of Bridgerton. In reality, the clothes of this period could be quite colorful, judging by the styles featured in fashion plates from the period. Dresses during this era were about ankle length. This was a sign of maturity because dresses worn by young girls and adolescents were considerably shorter. In one scene, Eloise goes to the modiste to have her hems dropped, and this signals a turning point in her coming of age. And then her outerwear. Daphne would likely be wearing a coordinating spencer, which could have been made to match the dress for a complete afternoon ensemble. A spencer was a short jacket that ended just below the bust, mirroring the high waistline of the fashionable Regency silhouette. The garment was named for the second Earl of Spencer, who popularized the style of cropped jackets for men. Women Spencers often had fullness in the upper sleeve and sometimes incorporated military-inspired decorative elements. Next, her hair and makeup. A young woman would wear her hair up after coming out into society. The fashionable hairstyles of the Regency period emulated those of ancient Greek statuary, which featured hair coiled at the back of the head with short face framing curls in the front. Daphne's short parted bangs seemed to be a modern take on this style. Cosmetics were used very sparingly, as the ideal of beauty was to appear fresh and youthful. In episode two, Daphne's lady's maid applies rouge of her own recipe. This likely would have been made with the root of an herb called alkanet, or otherwise with natural ingredients like sandalwood, brazil wood, and safflower. Which brings us to the bonnet. Bonnets are notably absent in the world of Bridgerton, at least among the principal characters. The bonnets of the early 19th century are not very conducive to film and television because they tend to obstruct the face. This is because they were intended to offer protection from the sun. In reality, a woman would never be seen outdoors with her head uncovered in this era. A bonnet is made up of a crown and a brim, with attached ribbons to tie underneath the chin. Bonnets were typically made of straw and were often decorated with ribbons, feathers, and silk flowers. In 1813, bonnets were of the high-crowned variety and had a curved brim. This style was not as extreme as the poke bonnet, which completely enveloped the wearer's head. Then her shoes. Daytime footwear consisted of flat lace-up ankle boots, which were typically made of soft fabric and thin leather soles. These would have been suitable for a casual promenade, which did not require rigorous walking. Pattens or overshoes would be worn for longer walks in the country. Finally, her accessories. Gloves, either made of cotton or leather, would complete the ensemble. A parasol would be a desirable accessory for any outdoor activity, as dress during this era prioritized protection from the sun. A small bag called a reticule would have allowed a woman to carry her personal belongings. The narrow Regency silhouette did not have room for pockets, and thus the bag emerged as an essential accessory in the early 19th century. So here's what Daphne would have looked like compared to what she wore in the series. Let's move on to the Duke of Hastings. This look appears in the same scene in episode two when Simon rides up on horseback. This speaks to the sporting English lifestyle that had a profound effect on men's fashion during this period. Following the French Revolution, fashion became increasingly understated and democratic. Flamboyantly brocaded and embroidered silks 
fine laces and bright colors disappeared from men's fashion with a great male renunciation around the turn of the 19th century. English style rose in popularity, which emphasized pastoral country living and skewed towards sportswear. The famed dandy Beau Brummel is often credited as being the arbiter of style in Regency England. Above all, Simon had to be portrayed as the ultimate romantic lead for the 21st century viewer, and so alterations were made to traditional Regency garb to accommodate this. Now we're going to draw every layer of this look. First up, the undergarments. Simon would be wearing drawers, which would have featured a high waist and a split crotch. These would be made from a thin stockinette that would conform to the body and not add too much bulk under the trousers. Socks would be worn, though drawers of the footed variety did exist. In general, the underwear in Bridgerton has been streamlined in order to accommodate ease of undress for the many intimate scenes throughout the series. Then the shirt. Throughout the series, Simon is sometimes shown wearing a dark-colored shirt, which would not have been accurate. Shirts of the early 19th century were made of white linen, and their cleanliness was seen as a sort of status symbol. These shirts had a distinctive high, upright collar and featured a ruffled front. Next up, his trousers. Knee-length breeches were still worn, but they were on their way out of style. Full-length trousers became more common in the 1810s. Pantaloons were a close-fitting alternative that buttoned at the ankle and featured a fall front. The rear was left baggy to accommodate sitting, but the rest of the garment was very, very fitted, especially through the legs. The intention was to show off the musculature of the leg, and it is said that padding was added to areas like the calves and thighs where men may have been lacking. Pantaloons placed an emphasis on virility, which underlies the whole look. And then the next layer. Simon usually wears his collar open, which is not accurate. This is a design choice that may be seen as a way to differentiate him from the other male characters, or to make him seem more rebellious. The collar of the shirt would stand straight up and fit around the jawline. Then a wide neck accessory would go over the shirt collar and extend up to just under the chin. One style of neck dressing was a pleated rectangular piece called a stock. Another option was the cravat, which was a long piece of fabric that could be wrapped around the neck and tied in a variety of extravagant ways. Which brings us to the waistcoat. Here, Simon wears a purple waistcoat. This signals his familial affiliation with Lady Danbury, who appears in rich shades of purple throughout the series. Waistcoats were actually much more sober in color and pattern, especially for daytime apparel. Still, the waistcoat was typically one of the more decorative aspects of men's dress, and they would become particularly flamboyant farther into the 19th century. Regency-era waistcoats were often double-breasted and fastened with a row of parallel buttons. A stand collar would nest over the shirt collar and cravat. Next up, the coat. Coats in the early 1800s were shortened to the natural high waist and front with long tails extending down the back. Overall, the silhouette was slender with sloping shoulders. These coats were not intended to match the trousers. Full suits for men would not come back into fashion until much later in the 19th century. The Regency tailcoat was double-breasted and could either be worn buttoned or open to reveal the waistcoat. And then his boots. Hessian boots were the most fashionable footwear option for men. One particular style, sometimes called a top boot, was two-toned with black and brown leather. The boots were inspired by the uniforms of the Hussars, which imbued Regency menswear with military overtones. These boots would have been considered appropriate for riding. That brings us to his hair. Men's hair was generally kept longer at the top and usually brushed forward. Long sideburns were the prevalent style of facial hair in the early 19th century. Beards and mustaches were rarely worn, so Simon would likely have been clean-shaven apart from the sideburns. Then his hat. Simon would be wearing a tall top hat. 
It would likely be covered in black silk with straight sides and a curved brim. Like the women in the show, the leading men of Bridgerton are lacking in headwear. Interestingly, the onlooking suitors in this scene are all wearing hats. It is a common occurrence in period films that the background actors be outfitted in a more historically accurate manner than the leading characters. They are meant to set the scene and situate the time period, and they don't need to be relatable to the viewers in the same way that the principal characters do. Finally, his accessories. Leather gloves and a walking stick would have completed Simon's promenading ensemble. He would also likely have a fob, to which he could attach his pocket watch. Throughout the series, Simon wears an emerald green enameled brooch on his lapel, which is supposed to have belonged to his late mother. Though lapel pins were not worn by men at this time, this is a sentimental touch that adds depth to his character. So this is what the Duke would have looked like. Next up, let's take a look at Penelope's butterfly dress. This look appears in episode one, where Penelope wears what was called full dress. This was the most formal version of evening attire and reserved for very special occasions. The Danbury Ball opened the season, and it was Penelope's first ever ball. So this is an instance that would have warranted a young debutante's sartorial finery. In stark contrast to the subdued hues of the Bridgerton family, the Featherington's color palette consists of bright citrus hues that speak to their garish nouveau riche tastes. This gown was skillfully embellished by the talented artisans on the Bridgerton costume crew and features a butterfly, which is the symbol of the Featherington family. The family's costumes are particularly ostentatious, often incorporating ahistorical textiles with elaborate embroidery and vibrant floral prints. So let's draw Penelope's look from the undergarments out. First up, undergarments. Penelope would start with a chemise as her innermost layer. She would also be wearing stockings, which could be quite colorful and decorated with fine embroidery. The Featheringtons would likely not be wearing the yet-to-be-widely-adopted drawers, and clearly their mother has antiquated sensibilities about undergarments. Tighter! Is she to breathe, Mama? Which brings us to the corset. Penelope would be wearing full-length stays, similar to those worn by her sister in the opening scene of the first episode. Because the corset of the Regency era was only lightly boned or corded, it offered little structure and wouldn't be used to dramatically reshape the body. The stiffest component would be an optional wooden busk that would be inserted in a center channel in order to separate the breasts which was desirable at the time. Additionally, the silhouette of the Regency era did not call for a cinched waist. And then the petticoat. A petticoat with an attached bodice would be worn as a modesty layer, but also as a decorative underdress. Evening dresses could be gossamer thin, and the petticoat was a layer that could add depth or variation of color when seen through the outer garment. Next up, the dress. Evening dresses during the Regency era featured short puffed sleeves and a low scooping neckline. This was the only time of day when it was acceptable to have exposed arms and revealing décolletage. The bosom was prominently featured in full dress, when the roundness of the breasts were accentuated by the placement of the waistline just underneath the bust. Penelope's dresses often feature a waistline that is slightly too high, cutting across the bust in a way that does not flatter the figure. The bobbinet lace machine was patented in 1808, which made lightweight, transparent fabrics more affordable and therefore more common for evening dresses. Delicate textiles were favored for evening wear, with decorative embroidery sparingly placed throughout the garment. For the Featheringtons, Mirajnik turned up the volume, using layers of heavily embroidered textiles further embellished with beading and rhinestones. And then the gloves. Evening gloves were long and covered the entire forearm. They were usually white or a light color and could be made of cotton or leather. The gloves in Bridgerton have a much tighter fit and seem to be made with spandex. Let's move on to her shoes. 
evening shoes were flat slippers with silk satin uppers and a thin leather sole. They were relatively simple and unadorned, except for the occasional small bow on the vamp of the shoe. Ribbons could be used to secure the slipper around the ankle, which would have been necessary when attending a ball with energetic dancing. And then the shawl. Penelope is sometimes seen wearing a shawl throughout the series. Shawls were made fashionable by the Empress Josephine, and Indian cashmere shawls were highly coveted in Europe in the early 19th century. During the Regency era, they were long and narrow, often with a paisley border print. Shawls could be worn throughout the evening, or they could be relinquished in the cloakroom upon arrival. That brings us to her hair. Because this is Penelope's first ball after coming out, she should be wearing her hair up. A historically accurate hairstyle would feature arranged curls in the back and face-framing ringlets in the front. She could also have a jeweled hair ornament woven into her arrangement of curls. Finally, her accessories. A dance card featuring the evening's program was given to each lady attending the ball so that she may allocate each dance to a potential suitor. The fan was an essential evening accessory, and an entire language of gestures developed out of women using them to signal their unspoken intentions. Penelope would be wearing a short beaded necklace and coordinating earrings, as she does in this scene. So this is what Penelope would have looked like. Finally, let's take a look at Queen Charlotte. This look appears in episode two, though Queen Charlotte wears similar styles throughout the series. The only character based on an actual historical figure, Queen Charlotte was the queen consort to King George III, and she held this position for over 50 years. The character in Bridgerton is peculiarly outfitted in styles from the late 18th century, from her earlier years as queen. It was during this period that most of her portraits were painted, which likely served as a point of inspiration for the Bridgerton showrunners. The antiquated 18th century styles worn by Queen Charlotte and her court in the series helped to establish her as a separate, powerful figure within the show's social ecosystem. In reality, Regency-era court dress incorporated elements from both the late 18th and early 19th centuries, resulting in an odd hybrid garment that is rarely seen in fashion history. So let's draw the Queen's look layer by layer. First up, undergarments. Queen Charlotte would be wearing the same undergarments worn with more conventional Regency-era styles, including the chemise and stockings. And then the next layer. The corset would also be in the conventional Regency style, likely the full stays. Next up, her petticoat. It is not widely documented if there was a special petticoat worn with this type of garment. However, the standard Regency full petticoat with the attached bodice would have been plausible. And then the hoop. The court hoop is the defining feature of this ensemble. Queen Charlotte was said to be resistant to changes in the tradition of court dress, which in the late 18th century incorporated a court hoop. This would be accurately described as a pannier in French fashion, which was a structured linen undergarment stiffened with hoops of cane or whalebone. The skirt would be flat in the front and back, and the fullness would be at the sides. Because Queen Charlotte advocated for the court hoop, which was so closely tied to 18th century fashion, it's easy to mistake her attire for an outdated style. In reality, English court dress was updated for the Regency era. Which brings us to the dress. The court dress of the Regency period was a strange combination of the shortened bodice that was fashionable in the early 19th century, joined with a wide skirt that was fashionable in the late 18th century. What makes this dress look so odd is the fact that the skirt's fullness begins at the garment's waistline, which during this period is right underneath the bust. This dissonant silhouette did not last beyond Queen Charlotte's reign because the court hoop was officially abolished under the next monarch. Not only would Queen Charlotte and her ladies-in-waiting be wearing this style, but all of the debutantes presented to her at court would be expected to wear this type of garment. Traditional court dress typically included a long train, which we do see the young ladies wearing in the first episode. Next, the Queen's hair. 
Queen Charlotte's outlandish wigs play on the French court styles made popular during the era of Marie Antoinette in the second half of the 18th century. These were notable for their extreme height and elaborate decoration. In reality, Queen Charlotte's hair would likely have followed the neoclassical styles that were fashionable for women during the Regency era. Even though they're not accurate, these fantastical wigs definitely add to the whimsy in the world of Bridgerton. Let's move on to the next layer. She would be wearing the same long white gloves and silk satin slippers that were required by full dress. She could be wearing the elaborate ostrich feather hair ornament that was worn exclusively at court. Because of her royal position, she would also have likely been wearing a tiara. Finally, her jewelry. As befitting a queen, Charlotte would likely have been decked out in some pretty sumptuous jewelry, probably in a matching set called a perore. These pieces would be made of precious stones and metals, and would only be accessible to the wealthiest and highest ranking members of society. Daphne gets a taste of what it might be like to join the royal family when the prince gifts her a diamond necklace. Overall, the characters in Bridgerton are absurdly blinged out in accordance with the exaggerated depiction of the English aristocratic class. So this is what Queen Charlotte would have looked like compared to the look in the series. Any final thoughts? Ellen Mirajnik's costumes transport us to a fantastical world brimming with sumptuous spectacle, and the anachronistic design elements help us to better understand the characters within the context of their society. Historical accuracy is sacrificed for the sake of accessibility, which ultimately has contributed to the show's great success.